Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 86 of Ben Franklin's World, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present day world we live in. Today, we're going to do something a bit novel in Ben Franklin's world. We're going to investigate the life of Benjamin Franklin. I know it sounds a bit crazy, but I think we're going to have a lot of fun. Given that Franklin lived such a long and rich life, we need a bit of focus for our investigation. So today, we'll explore how Franklin came to live in London and how living in that cosmopolitan city, which sat at the center of the British Empire, affected Franklin, and how he viewed the world. Our guide for this exploration is George Goodwin, author of Benjamin Franklin in London, The British Life of America's Founding Father. During our investigation, George reveals the story behind how Benjamin Franklin became a printer, details about Franklin's various stays in London, and how Franklin came to embrace the politics of the American Revolution. But first, have you sent me your questions yet? By listener request, episode 100 will be an interview with me, and I'd like to use the opportunity to answer your questions. So, what would you like to know about me or the show? Send your questions to liz at benfranklinsworld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment in Ben Franklin's World, our listener community on Facebook. Okay, are you ready to enter Benjamin Franklin's World? Let's go meet our guest historian. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Our guest is the honorary writer-in-residence at the Benjamin Franklin House in London. He has written three books, including Fatal Rivalry, Henry VIII, James IV, and The Battle for Renaissance England, and, most recently, Benjamin Franklin in London, The British Life of America's Founding Father. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, George Goodwin. Well, thank you very much indeed, Liz. I'm very much looking forward to this. George, your previous books have centered on English history during the 15th and 16th centuries. How did you come to study Benjamin Franklin and his world in London during the 18th century? Partly serendipity. My first two books were commissioned. They tied in with anniversaries. The first one was on the Wars of the Roses, centering on the Battle of Towton, which is the bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil, but a battle that people really didn't know too much about. So that was for the 550th anniversary. And the second one was on James IV of Scotland and Henry VIII, really putting forward that James IV was the greatest Scottish king, or rather would have been had he not lost the Battle of Flodden, and that was to tie in with the 500th anniversary. Now, I was just finishing off that book, and I was standing in my kitchen having a cup of coffee, and on the radio, they had a program called In Our Time, which is an excellent BBC Radio 4 program, and they had a program on Benjamin Franklin. And I thought to myself, the 18th century has always been the period that has interested me the most. And I was thinking of doing an 18th century book. But I have to say that I hadn't realized that there was this enormous great gap that nobody had written specifically about his time in London, which was obviously an incredibly important part of his life. So I thought, marvelous, here's my next book. And here's an opportunity to spend two years investigating the life of one of the greatest Americans who's ever lived. It's really interesting that you found so few books about Franklin's time in London, especially since Benjamin Franklin was British. He lived within the British Empire and his father immigrated from England during the 17th century. Would you tell us why the Franklin family left Old England for New England? In Benjamin Franklin's autobiography, which uh, must be sort of described as the first great celebrity autobiography, it's not quite warts and all. I mean, he's very good at presenting things in the light that he would like them to be seen. So, for instance, in the autobiography, he says that his father left England for North America in uh, 1683 because of religious persecution. 
That's actually not quite true. He was an economic migrant. And the reason being that Franklin's father, Josiah, and indeed the rest of the family, were silk dyers. And silk being very much a luxury good, there was a tendency for there to be ups and downs in economic conditions. He, along with his elder brother, also called Benjamin, decided that they would be better off economically if they migrated to North America. And once there, he went to Boston, the more sort of puritanical Boston, so not quite such a demand for silk. So he became a tallow chandler and soap maker with his own business. What I find curious about Benjamin Franklin is, as the ninth and youngest son of Josiah and Abby of Folger Franklin, Franklin's parents wanted him to be their tithing son, a son who entered the ministry. But Franklin became a printer. Would you tell us how that happened? Well, it's almost the sort of feeling that Josiah had that this was like a tithe, that he was going to give this son to the church. But young Ben rather resisted this. He actually wanted to go away to sea, like one of his elder brothers. Now, I should point out that, in fact, Josiah's first wife, who came with him from England, she died, and he remarried a girl from Nantucket, and Ben was the youngest son of the second family. But as I said, Ben resisted this. An elder brother had gone to sea, and Josiah was extremely keen that this shouldn't happen. And what he did is he took Ben around to see various different trades. And this was actually fascinating for the young Ben because he could see that his father would try his hand at all these different types of trade and show that, you know, he was a master of everything. He had this great sort of mechanical ability. This is actually something that he passed on to his son. So, I mean, if uh, Ben Franklin had been around today, he would have been absolutely brilliant at DIY. But it was decided in the end that Ben had a great interest in books. And one of his other brothers, James, had his own printing business that Josiah had set James up in. So Ben was apprenticed to brother James. I've heard that Ben's relationship with his brother James was rather rocky. Would you tell us about it? Yes, it was extremely rocky. James obviously beat his brother quite badly. He was a kind of disciplinarian. And often, Josiah had to come in and intervene on Ben's behalf. Now, Ben actually showed himself to be not only a very good as an apprentice printer, but he was also, at a very young age, a very good writer and journalist. And a breach in the relationship came about when Ben submitted secretly some articles for James's newspaper, The Courant. They were written in the character of a widow called Silence Do Good. And these were actually very funny and very, very entertaining. So James, not knowing the identity of the writer of these, put them on the front page of his newspaper. Now, after about 13 or 14 of these, Ben decided that he'd actually kind of run out of steam. But he was going to admit to being the author. But actually, that was a bit of a bad move because James rather resented the fact that Ben had sort of hid his identity. So there was more trouble between them. However, James relied on Ben because he himself got into problems by satirizing the Boston authorities. At one stage, he actually accused them of being complicit in piracy outside Boston. And this was too much. He was thrown into prison. So to carry on the paper, the paper had to be published under the name of another Franklin Young Ben. However, when James got out, he uh, tried to reinforce the discipline, but this was too much for Ben. And because Ben had actually been given the authority over the paper, this had, in a sense, breached the apprentice relationship legally, and he was actually able to leave. He sort of fled, and James was unable to do anything about it. James was actually able to try try and stop Ben getting any work in New York, which is where he went to first. But then he went to Philadelphia and set himself up in Philadelphia. Again, in the autobiography, you have Ben's description of him arriving in Philadelphia, reliant on the kindness of Quaker strangers. But in fact, again, that's slightly overdone because he had a skill. He had a great skill. He was a printer and was able to get work pretty much anywhere. And he quickly got that in Philadelphia. And then he was free from the grip of his brother. That's really interesting because we often think of Ben Franklin as a runaway, that he ran away from his brother, Boston, and just kind of ended up in Philadelphia. 
But it sounds like Ben didn't run away. He was actually free to leave. Well, he was technically free to leave because of this breach in the um, apprenticeship that James, in order to keep the newspaper going, had to establish his brother in kind of temporary charge. In fact, it was printed under the name of one Benjamin Franklin, and that actually breached the arrangement. Ben didn't stay in Philadelphia long because in 1724, his ambition to become a printer led him to visit London. George, would you tell us about Franklin's first trip to England and the impression it made upon him? Now, the reason he was en route to London was Governor Keith fell in with him to the extent that he visited Franklin where he was working and made him an offer. He treated this teenager regally, really, took him along to the local tavern, filled him up with Madeira and had this plan, which is that they could set up uh, in business together. And young Franklin thought this would be wonderful because he'd get the printing business for the governor and that would set him up pretty much for life. Now, in order to do this, they needed to get a printing press. And the printing presses were manufactured in England, as was most manufacture, because there was restraint on manufacturing in America. America was seen to be the place which produced raw materials to be finished off in Britain. The finished goods would be exported back to America. So he had to go to London for the printing press. He had letters of introduction given to him, or so he thought, by Governor Keith. They were brought on board the ship as it was about to sail, or so he thought. But when he got to London, he found actually that these letters were completely and utterly worthless. And it's not quite sure why Keith actually did this. There's no sort of real explanation of why he led this poor lad astray and promised him all kinds of things which he couldn't deliver on. But this seemed to be a bit of a trait of Keith. Anyway, Franklin arrived in London, suddenly discovered that he was marooned. But once again, he didn't have a problem. He got work incredibly quickly because he was a printer. Again, in the autobiography, we get the most wonderful depiction of London. London was a new city. After the Great Fire of London of 1666, and we're talking really just sort of 60 years afterwards, it burned down a vast percentage of the city of London. It had been rebuilt by Christopher Wren, and it's described by Daniel Defoe. And we know that Franklin was a great reader of writers such as Defoe. So he was there, he got the impression of London, but he already had the context of the new city of London from what he'd been reading before he actually arrived there. And he had a whale of a time. Okay, he didn't have a great deal of money, partly because he was also paying for a friend of his, James Ralph, who was a bit of a hanger-on. And Ralph, again, was somebody a little bit like Keith, who had all kinds of imaginary ideas of how he'd get on. He thought he could be an actor, and that was turned down. He thought he could be a writer, didn't actually make too good a job of that. So in the end, he became a school teacher and disappeared off to a school in the country and had adopted the pseudonym of a new personality, one Benjamin Franklin, which was rather entertaining. And uh, he said that Franklin should write to him in the country, address him as Benjamin Franklin. This could lead to a little bit of confusion, but Franklin himself thought this actually was quite amusing. So he settled down in London for 18 months. He was able to adapt to life in London pretty well because of his reading and because of his ability to write and to print. And he'd dreamed of London Coffee House Society back in America. And he'd read and rewritten, and this is actually where he got his writing ability from, he'd rewritten The Spectator of Joseph Addison, who he regarded as one of the greatest pens to adorn the English language. He wrote that many years later. And he was able to infiltrate London Coffee House Society. And this was a major influence on him for the rest of his life. London must have been something for Franklin to experience, because how did Boston and Philadelphia compare with London? I have to imagine that London eclipsed both colonial cities in terms of population and size. London was absolutely enormous. I mean, if you compare the population figures, I mean, Boston and Philadelphia were tiny. Boston had a population of around about 12,000. Philadelphia, about 7,000. London had around about 600,000. We are talking of the largest city in the Western world, a sort of great metropolis. 
and one that he actually found his way into really quite easily. He did all kinds of other things in London. There's one rather amusing thing. He was a great swimmer, and his sort of ability to swim was noted, and he became a swimming instructor. He actually thought at one stage that he might stay in London, not go home, and actually set himself up as a permanent swimming instructor. And had he done that, of course, he would have been successful in that as he was in pretty much everything else. But in the end, he decided to go back to Philadelphia. The reason for this was that he'd become very friendly with a merchant who he'd traveled across from Philadelphia in 1724. And the idea was that they would sort of set up in business with a store. And this chap, uh, Denham, paid for his passage back. So that's how he arrived back in Philadelphia. But he took with him back from London all kinds of ideas about setting up, almost recreating elements of the London society that he had loved and enjoyed. And indeed, he set up his own club with others, the Junto, in the late 1720s, very soon after he arrived back. Did Franklin bring back a printing press from London or did he set up shop with his new companion in Philadelphia? He literally, as you say, set up shop. But unfortunately, Denham became very ill and died. And Franklin himself was extremely ill. But because he had a much stronger constitution, he actually survived. And he decided that he actually wanted to go back in printing and got himself a job with Samuel Keimer, who he'd worked for before he went to London. They didn't get on particularly well. It was a sort of an extraordinary relationship where they each were playing a waiting game, if you like, that Keimer wanted to take all Franklin's skills and to educate up other printers. And Franklin was looking to save up money until he could find another partner and set up business on his own or in a partnership, which is actually what he did. Yeah. Would you tell us about Benjamin Franklin's printing partnership? Because Franklin goes on to establish a printing empire. He certainly did. Now, with his initial partner, that lasted for a couple of years. He was actually far more interested in printing. His partner was rather more interested in drinking. So after a while, Franklin actually had the ability, with the support of a couple of his Junto friends, to buy this chap Meredith out, and he set up on his own. Again, from his London days, he had been very helpful to Andrew Hamilton, who was the lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania. And he'd helped Hamilton because amongst the letters that he'd found that he thought were for him, he actually found one which was a conspiracy by Keith to do down Hamilton. And he was actually able to tell Hamilton. And when he got back to Pennsylvania, Hamilton was able to return the favor and actually gave him the assent assembly printing. So he actually ended up gaining the printing business for Pennsylvania that he'd hoped to gain for Keith. And this really helped to establish him. Now, with that contract under him, he also became the clerk to the assembly of Pennsylvania. So that was quite useful as well, sort of tying the two together. But what he also did was he expanded. He set up a number of satellite printing businesses down the Atlantic seaboard. And what he was able to to do. This is quite revolutionary. He had one typeface, the Caslon typeface, which all the satellite printers had. So if he had a very big job, he was actually able to divide it between them. It was quite a simple plan, but a sensible one. Occasionally, they actually had a bit of a problem because they were relying on type to come over from Britain. But I mentioned earlier about his DIY ability. He was actually able to fix the broken type himself, which was extremely useful. Now, he started to publish his own newspaper, the Pennsylvania Gazette, and he also published Poor Richard's Almanac, which was an essential annual for people living in Pennsylvania, mainly out of the towns, because it gave them crucial information such as the moon, sun, tide times, and sort of information, saints' days, etc., that they might need on a kind of annual basis 
But it also had entertaining articles. And this is where a lot of the Benjamin Franklin quotes come from. So we have the death and taxes quote, which actually, I mean, he was very good at this. He was very good at taking other people's quotes and making them better. So the original version of the death and taxes quote actually came from Daniel Defoe. But he filled out the almanac with quotes. Actually, a particular favorite of mine is three can keep a secret if two of them are dead. So these became very entertaining annuals that were appreciated and he made a fortune out of them. He was the top almanac seller along the Atlantic seaboard, which of course he was able to sell through his satellite printing businesses. And he was also a great merchant, almost fulfilling the idea of Denham setting him up in business. At one time, he was the largest paper merchant in North America. And Franklin's story is often represented as a rags to riches story. That's actually not quite true because his father was an independent businessman. In fact, I found out Franklin's mother had her portrait painted in 1713. And you had to have a certain wherewithal to have your portrait painted. But the rags to riches thing is rather entertaining because rags were used in printing. And Franklin and his wife, Deborah, became the largest collector of rags in North America. I mean, in six years, they were able to collect 166 pounds in weight of rags, which they turned into 1,000 pounds. So that really was a kind of rags to riches element. But he was an incredibly successful printer, so much so that at the age of 40, in 1748, he was able to retire or well, semi-retire. He became a sleeping partner in his printing business. Franklin was a witty and intelligent writer. He was a wealthy printer and businessman. But we also remember him because he liked to experiment in the natural sciences. Would you tell us about Franklin's scientific work and how that elevated him to celebrity status? He had a very good relationship with Peter Collinson, who was an exporter of books from Britain. He was a general merchant. I mean, he was a great renowned botanist in Britain, and he did a lot of importation of American plants. And as a result of this relationship, knowing that uh, Franklin had expressed an interest in science, Collinson sent over the kit in the form of electrical experimental equipment, the Leyden jars. And Franklin sort of fell upon this after his retirement. In fact, he described this in a letter to Collinson as the thing that had most fascinated him in his entire life, which bearing in mind the sort of things that he'd already done was quite something. And with his experiments, came up with a new theory of electricity. He's probably best known for the realization of the static electricity in the atmosphere and how it could be neutralized by the invention of the lightning conductor. But what actually made him famous was the publication in Britain due to the efforts of Peter Collinson and also Dr. John Fothergill, the two great sort of Quaker supporters of his in England, was the publication of Franklin's observations and experiments in electricity made in Philadelphia. And this was sensational. It got him awarded the Copley Prize from the Royal Society, which was the equivalent of the Nobel Prize at the time. And as a result of which, he became famous. I mean, Immanuel Kant described him as the Prometheus of modern times. He wasn't just famous in Britain and America. He was famous across Europe. And this meant that when he actually came over to Britain again, he had an entree in intellectual and aristocratic society because there was kind of scientific craze in Britain amongst the aristocracy, amongst men and women, for things that, that sizzled and banged and for science in general. And he was able to to take advantage of this. Speaking of things that sizzled and banged, did Franklin really fly a kite with a key on it to test a theory about electricity? Yes, he did fly a kite, but it wasn't to so much test the theory, but because other people had already done the same experiment. And he knew about this. They'd actually done it in France. And in terms of the sizzling and bang, I mean, quite often in France, playing around with electricity and playing around with lightning in particular is pretty dangerous stuff. So quite a few of these people had come to a sticky end. So he did do the kite experiment, but it was actually as a kind of 
further proof to himself of what he already knew to be the case. But it is the kite experiment that he's sort of more famous for today. And in fact, even in the time of the 19th century, where, you know, you had banknotes with the kite experiment on. And it's actually quite interesting the way that Franklin's image has sort of mutated according to the time. I mean, there's one banknote from 1886 that I found, which has sort of Franklin looking like a sort of post-American Civil War gentleman. And as it's from Texas, there's his son, William, with whom he conducted the kite experiment. As a child, William was actually a grown man when the original experiment was done. I think he's wearing a Confederate cap on this banknote. So it's part of the Franklin myth, but it was basically the book that made Franklin famous. Now let's explore Franklin's second stay in London. As a proprietary colony, the government of Pennsylvania had to answer to the colony's proprietors, the Penn family. Controversy between the Penn family and the Pennsylvania Assembly caused the Assembly to send Franklin to London to negotiate with Thomas Penn in 1757. George, would you tell us about the disagreements between the Pennsylvania Assembly and the Penn family and why they sent Franklin to negotiate these disagreements? You have to bear in mind that Pennsylvania was owned by the Penn family. If you like, they were sort of freeholders of Pennsylvania. And everybody who bought property from them or land from them effectively had to pay sort of quit rents or the avoidance, if you like, of feudal dues. So it was actually it was like paying a freehold rent. They were amazingly rich. They were absentee landlords in London. Thomas Penn was the son from a second marriage with William Penn. And he and his brothers had actually converted from being Quakers to the Church of England and established themselves within the English aristocracy. So they appointed lieutenant governors to manage Pennsylvania for them. But there was a sort of division of rule, if you like, because the lieutenant governors had to run Pennsylvania along with the Pennsylvania Assembly. Now, the major problem that the two parties had was that the Penn family didn't pay any taxes. They could be pushed in emergency situations such as during King George's War in the 1740s to give an emergency grant for the militia to defend against the French. But they weren't obliged to pay taxes. When Franklin came over in 1757, appointed because he'd become a major figure in the Pennsylvania Assembly, when he retired, he stopped being a clerk and he actually became an elected official. And before very long, he became a very important leading elected official official within the assembly. He was sent over to negotiate with Thomas Penn for the Penns to pay taxes. The reason being that the French were a threat again because the French and Indian Wars, or collectively the Seven Years' War, had already begun in the Seven Years' War in 1756. But of course, there had been problems with the French in America before. The French were regarded as a real threat, and they needed to have money paid by the Penn family to help facilitate the defense of Pennsylvania. So Franklin was sent over to be a representative of the Assembly of Pennsylvania to try and negotiate with Thomas Penn and also to represent the Assembly's affairs in London as a lobbyist, not only to the Penn family, but to the British government in general. Was it typical for colonies to send representatives to London to lobby members of parliament on their behalf? Oh, absolutely. One can almost sort of think in terms of a comparison with lobbyists today, both here in Britain and also very much in Washington. The agents were representatives of the colonies. They were there to talk to the government and to prospective members of future governments. They were to be a sort of a two-way service, if you like, of passing on news and informing the assembly of parliamentary acts that had been passed. They presented petitions to the king, which was effectively to the government, and they promoted trade, they settled land disputes, they handled the colony finances in London. They were truly representative. And we have to remember that the colonies, when Franklin came over in 1757, they didn't necessarily get on at all well when it came to settling land disputes. There were often near wars over lands 
to the West, and they actually needed to have the British government, the Privy Council, and at the end, the Attorney General, to actually sort out these disputes. So they were very, very important figures. What did Franklin think of London 30 years after his first trip? Well, he found that it had expanded even more. I mean, the population figure is sort of quite difficult to pin down. But, I mean, if we take the figure between 1700, I mean, just before Franklin's birth, and around about 1750, where we have pretty clear evidence of population in 1700 was 575,000, just 50 years later, it had expanded to 675,000. The whole of what is now sort of Mayfair and Belgrade had been opened up. A new bridge had been built at Westminster Bridge. Further bridges were being built. And this was actually expanding London to the west. And it was a very, very rich, even richer than when he'd been there before, a rich and vibrant city. So what was Franklin's life like? And how did he negotiate London society and all of its social hierarchies? The aforementioned Peter Collinson was incredibly helpful to him because through his botanical imports from America, he had become a great favorite of members of the British aristocracy. We have to remember this is the age of capability, great sort of landscape gardening projects, and sort of the creation of what we now regard as sort of traditional 18th century parkland. And one of his key patrons was the Earl of Butte. Now, the Earl of Butte was a tutor to King George III. Uh, He'd been a great friend of King George's father, and in that had been one of the prime movers in what we now know as Kew Gardens. But the key thing was that Collinson was able to introduce him to Butte. Now, there was a difference between 1757 and 1760. When he came over in 1757, it was the sort of final years of George II, and the ministers in post were actually quite sort of tied in with or supportive of Thomas Penn and supportive of Thomas Penn's attitude towards Franklin, which was that you know, Franklin might have sort of traction with people who were interested in science, but not with the men in power. When Butte came into power, which he did with the ascendancy of George III in 1760s to the throne, Franklin, via Collinson, and actually via a number of other people, became quite well connected with Butte. And this introduced him properly into aristocratic political society. So he was in a very, very strong position. Franklin spent the early days of the American Revolution in London. So let's take a look at how he experienced the event. On 22 March 1765, Parliament passed the Stamp Act. The goal of the act was to raise revenue from the colonies that would defray the cost of the 10,000 troops Great Britain had stationed in North America to protect them. Prior to passing the act, Prime Minister George Grenville met with colonial agents such as Benjamin Franklin to discuss the act. George, would you tell us about Franklin's involvement with the Stamp Act? Franklin actually came up with an extremely good plan, which was to suggest to Grenville that instead of introducing this Stamp Act, which uh, we have to bear in mind was a stamp on every single negotiated piece of paper. So it wasn't just on house sales, but it was on university degrees, playing cards on newspapers. Now, that was a bad idea because, of course, it brought the newspapers out against it. What Franklin suggested would be a much better idea would be to introduce paper currency and have a 6% coupon on it. So it would be a way of boosting and securing trade, but also giving a sort of firm government revenue. This was rejected. So what Franklin did was he took the attitude that the Stamp Act was going to be inevitable. So he suggested a stamp tax collector, his friend John Hughes, might be the stamp collector for Pennsylvania. However, as we know, the Stamp Act created absolute uproar in America because this was seen to be going against the American charters where the American assemblies and the colonies were responsible for raising an internal tax, not the British government. Franklin realized quite late 
What the problem was, he heard back from his wife, Deborah, that there had been sort of an attack on his house because he was actually blamed for the Stamp Act. However, he came out of it absolutely smelling of roses because Grenville's government fell, the Marquis of Rockingham's government came in, and they introduced a parliamentary inquiry to which Franklin was the absolute star witness a result of which the Stamp Act was removed and he was a great hero. Of course, it helped the fact that his exploits were able to be sort of bruited abroad through the newspapers, which, of course, he was still the sleeping partner in. So um, he came up, uh, as I said, smelling of roses. And there was actually a slight fly in the ointment, which in order to get the repeal through Parliament, Rockingham introduced the Claritory Act, which said, oh, well, this was actually for the British backbenchers. What it said was that they would have the right to tax the American colonies, but don't worry about that. It's something we're not going to actually enforce. I'm afraid that rather stored up problems for the future. What caused Franklin's shift towards revolutionary politics? Was it the Declaratory Act that caused him to become critical of Parliament and its taxation policies? It wasn't the Declaratory Act because he said, well, they have a Declaratory Act with Ireland, which they've never enforced, so it should be okay. However, Rockingham's government fell. You're getting an idea of the complete instability of British governments in the 1760s. William Pitt, the elder Earl of Chatham, came in. This should have been the solution. He was the great victor of the Seven Years' War. Unfortunately, he had both a physical and mental illness, and he was completely unable to to govern at that point. And his Chancellor of the Exchequer, Charles Townsend, came in and he introduced the Townsend duties on paper, on paint, on glass, and on tea, which were duties enforced in America. So that was an internal tax. And that really was the point when Franklin began to wonder whether the relationship between Britain and America was going to break down. And he was extremely upset about it because, you know, in 1754, he'd been at the Congress of Albany and he and two others had come up with a plan for a unification of the colonies as a kind of defensive alliance against France. The colonies themselves had turned it down and the British had turned it down. Franklin could see the great potential of North America and he wanted it for Britain. He wanted a British North America. But after the Townsend duties came in, he started to worry. He wrote to a great friend of his saying that he was worried about what was going to happen. And what worried him mostly was not what it was going to do to America. He thought America would be okay. He just thought it would be a missed opportunity for Britain. And unfortunately, after the Declaratory Act, you got into a cycle of resistance of the American colonies, the introduction of British troops into Boston to put down what they regarded as illegal activity. And then this just was on a ratchet of American opposition and British kind of reinforcement, and they were never able to get out of this. In the end, the British government became stable, but only because they had an anti-American majority within it. Firstly, the Duke of Grafton, and then from 1770, Lord North's government. Lord North himself was not anti-American, but ministers in his government were, and he was a member of a collective cabinet. He's certainly not this kind of tyrant against America that he's sort of painted as being. But from that moment onwards, I'm afraid, really, that the die was cast. And Franklin was able to keep different options open for himself and for America. So, you know, as late as the 1770s, he was still hoping that there would be a change of government and there would be a return of the supporters of Rockingham and now of a restored William Pitt, the elder Earl of Chatham, who were more pro-American. That would be a way of resolving the problems. At the same time, he was also open in the late 1760s for the possibility of a job within the British government. This was actually offered to him as well as rather kind of dangled in front of him. But he had two other options. Another one was to found a new colony in what is now West Virginia. But there was the fourth option, which is he took on New Jersey, Georgia, and Massachusetts. Massachusetts, obviously, the place, the colony of his birth, but also the most radical of the colonies. And that obviously put him very much in the firing line as far as the British government was concerned. 
Let's talk about his place in the firing line. On 2 December 1772, Franklin wrote to Thomas Cushing of Massachusetts. In his letter to Cushing, Franklin enclosed two letters, one from Massachusetts Governor Thomas Hutchinson and the other from his Lieutenant Governor, Andrew Oliver. Franklin's letter and its enclosures led Massachusetts to petition for the removal of Hutchinson and Oliver. As the colonial agent for Massachusetts, the Privy Council summoned Franklin to appear, which he did on 29 January 1774. George, would you tell us about the letter Franklin sent to Cushing, its enclosures, and his appearance before the Privy Council? Well, what was in the letters, it was a misinterpretation. Basically, it was saying, or is interpreted as saying, that Hutchinson and Oliver were actually for the suppression of colonial liberties. That was a slight misrepresentation. But because of the tenor of the times, because of the fact that Massachusetts was in uproar, also because Hutchinson was seen as somebody who was on the spot trying to take away the liberties of the assembly. Whether that is actually a completely true interpretation, again, is open to question. Franklin sent the letters over to Cushing, and he said, these are for your information, and a few trusted individuals. They soon got leaked into the press and were published. Now, the reason Franklin did this wasn't to exacerbate the problems with Britain. He saw this as a kind of possible solution, because what he wanted to do was he wanted to represent Hutchinson and Oliver as being unrepresentative of the approach of Britons in general, men who were actually militating against the colonies without the support of Britons. Unfortunately, that was not how they were interpreted. Cushing certainly and others kept Franklin's identity secret. Nobody knew who had actually leaked these letters. However, there was an absolute furore in Britain after they were published, and it led to a duel between two gentlemen who accused each other of being the leakers of the letters. These guys actually weren't very good at dueling, so not much happened. They sort of slithered around in mud for a bit. But then they were going to fight another duel. At that stage, Franklin stepped in and owned up. Now, there was a real sort of uh, problem of timing here because he knew that he'd been summoned to talk about the letters to the Privy Council. However, he actually postponed the appearance because he heard that the government, the Attorney General, was going to bring in lawyers. So he wanted to have his own legal representation. Incidentally, these were actually people from the opposition. Not too surprisingly, because Franklin was very much seen as a member, not only of the American opposition, but the British opposition by this stage. This postponement was crucial because, just before he appeared, news filtered through of the Boston Tea Party for which he was seen to be responsible as the representative of Massachusetts here in London. And he was the subject of a humiliating tirade from the Attorney General Alexander Wedderburn, which he actually stood stoically complete and utter silence. So do you think it was Franklin's experience before Wedderburn and the Privy Council that led him to fully embrace patriot politics? That's an extremely good question. That is quite a, I wouldn't like to say a standard interpretation, but that certainly is one interpretation. That the humiliation before the Privy Council was thought to be so great that this actually made him revolt against Britain in its entirety. I actually don't go with that at all. The reason being that certainly it showed a complete and utter breakdown between him and the British government. I mean, he was immediately afterwards sacked from his position as Deputy Postmaster General. However, he was still embraced by the English political opposition, which he hoped would be returned to government under Rockingham and more to the point under Chatham. I mean, within a couple of weeks of this supposed humiliation, mediation where a number of writers have said, oh, well, you know, Franklin disappeared and didn't come out in public. Actually, that's completely and utterly wrong. I mean, he was at a rather splendid demonstration by David Hartley, who was a Rockinghamite, of his fire retardation process. I sort of set fire to a house and they all watched 
as it didn't burn. You know, the documents show that he was not only there with Hartley, but also still going to the clubs that he'd always gone to. So, you know, he was accepted within the clubs of the Royal Society. And most importantly, he started in the summer of 1774 to have meetings with the Earl of Chatham to come up with a solution. And eventually, in early 1775, Chatham actually came up with his proposal. And it was the complete and utter rejection of Chatham's proposals in February 1775 and the attack on Franklin himself as being part of that process. In fact, the Earl of Sandwich said in response to Chatham's speech and introduction of the proposals for a settlement, he said that he thought that this could not be the product of an Englishman, that he thought it was the product of some American. And he looked directly at Franklin, who was at the Strangers Gallery of the House of Lords at the time, and there was no doubt at all who he meant, that basically he was treating Franklin as an alien, as the most mischievous and dangerous enemy this country had ever known. It wasn't the country that Franklin was against, it was against the government. He still was trying to come up with a solution in March 1775 when he had to flee back to America. He had to flee because he knew that members of the North government were seeking his arrest. It's time for the Time Warp. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. The Time Warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. In your opinion, What might have happened if Parliament hadn't rejected the Earl of Chatham's proposal? Would Ben Franklin have remained loyal to Great Britain? And if so, what effect would the absence of Patriot Ben Franklin have had on the American Revolution? Well, if Parliament had accepted Chatham's proposal, and actually I'm afraid by 1775 it was extremely unlikely because there was a very strong permanent majority for the government. I mean, the opposition did very well if they actually got a third of the vote in the two houses of parliament. But let's assume that Chatham had actually come up with a solution. Well, had there been a solution, there would have been no American uh, War of Independence because there would have been no reason for there to have been one. Looking back and thinking about it now, almost the extraordinary behavior of the British government that they managed to get all the colonies to support Boston, which was the most radical place in America, and actually come behind it. That was actually the most extraordinary thing about the coming of the American Revolution. And, you know, I really do think that it was a revolution made in Britain, and it was made by the activities of the British government, who really didn't actually understand the true feelings of their American subjects, whatever Franklin would have presented to them. I'm afraid by that stage, that was kind of like the fixed view. Now that you've had time to commune with the 18th century, are you working on another 18th century project? I'm thinking of actually taking this forward, and it will be not so much a biography of Benjamin Franklin, but Benjamin Franklin will have a key role. I'm thinking of doing a book on the Americans in London and in Paris during the American Revolution, and with a provisional title of Benjamin Franklin's War. Because the extraordinary thing is that John Adams believed, or rather feared, that uh, in future ages, Washington and Franklin would be given all the credit for the victory in the American Revolution. In fact, that's really not that far off, because after all, Franklin went to France, he brought the French into the war, and he kept them there. And after all, it was the French Navy that cut off the British Navy and allowed the encirclement at Yorktown. Is there a website where we can go to find out more information about you and how we can get in contact with you if we still have questions about Benjamin Franklin's time in London? Well, do, please. I have my own website, which is georgegoodwin.com. And if you send an email to george at georgegoodwin.com, then it will come through to me. George Goodwin, thank you for helping to bring Ben Franklin into Ben Franklin's world. We really enjoyed our conversation with you. Thank you very much indeed, Liz. I very much enjoyed it. Franklin's time in London allowed him to understand English culture in a way that most of his fellow Americans could not. Unlike Franklin, 
they did not have the firsthand opportunities to experience English culture in London because most did not have the opportunity or the wherewithal to journey across the Atlantic Ocean. Of course, the same could be said of Britons who lived in the British Isles. Most of them never had the opportunity to venture across the Atlantic and experience British American culture. Like their American counterparts, what they knew of their brethren across the ocean came from newspapers, books, speeches, artwork, or perhaps a chance meeting with a North American. Franklin's understanding of both British and British American cultures, not to mention his global renown as a scientist, made him an ideal colonial agent. As George revealed, by the time Franklin returned to London in 1757, he had enough money and reputation to mix with the movers and shakers of British government. He knew how to socialize with and lobby these men on behalf of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Georgia. It was as a colonial agent that Franklin experienced the early days of the American Revolution. His experiences in America gave him firsthand knowledge of why Americans were upset with parliamentary taxation and governance, just as his interactions with members of parliament allowed him to see how they understood or misunderstood colonial fury over the Stamp Act, Townsend Duties, and the Tea Act. Franklin tried to navigate a diplomatic solution between Great Britain and her North American colonies, but his intimate knowledge of the cultures and politics of both places also allowed him to see when the time for diplomacy had passed. Franklin had a decision to make, stand as an American or as an Englishman. He chose American and made his way back across the Atlantic to serve his country. And as George mentioned, he made his way back in the nick of time because Parliament had a warrant out for his arrest. You can find more information about George, his book, Benjamin Franklin in London, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page, benfranklinsworld.com slash 086. If you'd like to know more about Benjamin Franklin, consider checking out episodes 1, 22, and 31. Each of these episodes covers a different aspect of his life. For your convenience, I've listed these episodes in the show notes. Are you a member of the Ben Franklin's World listener community? The community is hosted on Facebook and it's free to join. All you need to do is text BFWORLD to 33444 or click on the orange Join Now button on the main page of BenFranklin'sWorld.com. Finally, what do you think would have happened if Benjamin Franklin had remained loyal to Great Britain? Send your answers to Liz at BenFranklin'sWorld.com, tweet me at Liz Covart, or post a comment on the show notes page for this episode or in Ben Franklin's World, our listener community on Facebook. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.